There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Well, I've got a big glob of toothpaste on above my lip. Looks terrible on big screens, not so noticeable on small screens. I'm not sure whether it's I have no shame, but I certainly don't have the energy to redo this Friday read, so maybe another New Year's resolution will be uh, doing a thorough face check before I record the freaking video. <clears throat> Happy New Year. Is it time? Have I not said Happy New Year to you yet? No, I haven't. Happy New Year, and uh, here I am back with another Friday Reads. And I'm actually taping this for the first time maybe ever, or in years, using my desktop computer. Because as you probably noticed on the bites, on the uh, besties and worsties, I suddenly have developed this huge problem, new problem with recording videos, which is audio drift. Oh my god, it was terrible. I'd noticed it a little bit before, but it suddenly, really, that that was embarrassing, because otherwise I was quite pleased with how that turned out, and apparently so were a, a few of you. So, sorry about the audio drift. I did find a workaround, and I don't want to go down into the weeds about this. There's free software called Handbrake, and it's something to do with bit rates and something, something, and you just got to run it through that program, and, and it does work. Uh, because the uh, bite-sized book chats I just put up last night, I noticed that the uh, Zoom chat I had with Brandon had some audio drift near the end, and I ran it through, and no more audio drift. But it takes a long time to run it through that handbrake program. So basically adding another 30 to 60 minutes in my Friday Reads processing time. So I figure when I'm recording at the computer, and this is a test run, the audio, I've got the new mic, the video looks pretty good actually, because of my new webcam. It's not that new, but anyway, so we're going to go with this uh, for the time being and see if it works. And if there's audio drift on this, I'm going to cry. <laughs> so while I've had lots of computer issues and, and the like, I have had a f absolutely fantastic week one of my 2022 reading year, and that's all I've done. I mean, I've done booktube stuff, and I've read, and I've napped, and and that's about it. It's been a glorious week. I have just a few more days left to go. Most of you have gone back to work this week, but not me. I go back on Monday. Oh, and I had the, the, the most stable part of my three-week holiday routine has been reading up for about an hour a night to Lindy, and uh, we're going to make a video about that because that's been absolutely a fantastic thing for me to do. And we have both generated massive TBRs. Oh, speaking of Lindy, I am so sleepy at 7.10 a.m. Uh, Lindy is on BookTube. I sent out a, an announcement. It's the first one I ever sent out. And apparently it worked because a bunch of you found her channel. So if you, those of you that haven't, I will have a link at the top of my show notes. Her new channel is Lindy's Magpie Reads. Don't think she's quite yet explained that, but maybe I'm the only one in the world who didn't know a damn thing about magpies, despite growing up on a farm in Saskatchewan. But the, there is an interesting reason. So Lindy, make a video about your name. She has just hit the ground running. She's had pretty much of a video a day, and she's a natural, and I am absolutely delighted that she has come to BookTube. Her channel has a very unique, warm, deliciously nerdy, bookish feel to it. So please go check out Lindy's Magpie Reads. So yes, I've been busy here on BookTube. Here is the Week in Review. Do you have any year-end reading rituals, things like wrap-up or statistics that you do, any special videos or podcast episodes, blog entries, anything that you sometimes do or typically do at the end of the year for your reading life? Anna. No, I don't. I'm <laughs> I'm useless, Sean. What I'll say um, is that her editor, whoever her editor was, needs some assertiveness training because this was padded with junk. It wasn't just a great circle. It was a, a book that uh, talked in circles, <laughs> was written in circles, it was just a downward spiral of circular, <laughs> circular narrative diarrhea. I had the understanding that he is taking his daughter, Ruth, to New York, he doesn't intend bringing her back. You, you know, you, you start the book saying, he's taking a 16 year old. He hasn't told her that she's never going to become, that he's leaving her in New York. 
And you just think, what the hell? You know, I mean, so I've started nine books this week, and uh, so I have ten on the go because of the Clarissa audiobook that carried over from last year. And oh my goodness, I don't think I have a bad thing to say about any of them. So this is going to be a very uh, upbeat, positive Friday read. So you, if, those of you that are here looking for a rant, I don't have one this week. Let's start with the two tomes that I'll be reading for much of the year. First is Miljenko Yurkovich's Kin. This is a, I think it's about 900 pages, and it is translated from the Croatian by Russell Scott Valentino, and it is, I don't know, if, I'm not sure, the genre, autofiction. It is about Jurkovic's family, and it certainly reads like a novel, but I think it's mostly true or completely true, beautifully written, it covers the whole 20th century for this region in the turbulent Balkans, as it says in the back. I won't read to you from it, although I'm dying to. Every time I pick it up and read 10 more pages, I, I get at least one long quote that I have shared, and they have been getting some attention. Even from the author, Miljenko Jurgovic, who is now following me on Instagram and has given me carte blanche permission to quote anything I want and use any photos of him I can find online. So that was a lovely little interaction. I love it so much. I don't know the history of this area all that well, and I don't need to. It's explained in the context of all the various members of his family. It's so rich. I mean, I've read 24 pages, so this is going to be quite the undertaking, but uh, every time I open it, I just fall deep into it. It's not a buddy read because I don't do those anymore, but it's uh, kind of a pseudo buddy read with the Irish novelist Ronan Hessian. We're going to make a video about it or something when we've finished in, prox in, in approximately June. Ah. And I have also started my Mooks and Grapes uh, bucket list book, uh, one of them for the 2022, A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth, and I absolutely love this too. This one, now who was I talking to? Joe Smith. Joe Smith is reading it too, and she heard me say last week that it would take me a year, but I may actually consider her strategy. She's going to power through it, not power through it, she's going to read it much more quickly because there's so many names to keep track of. She thinks that she will lose track of it if she reads it at a slower pace. I'm 30 pages into it, so I've read it for about three days out of the past week. I've gleaned a certain amount about various cultures in India and uh, food and stuff, but uh, not very much. And uh, I'm looking stuff up all the way through this and having such a good time. It's set in a fictional city in a fictional state, but it's interesting he's using the name of a state that was considered to be an amalgamation of two other states that didn't actually go through, but he set it there. Um, so I guess it's probably set in the, the states that didn't join. Any of the references to writers and musicians and stuff are real because I'm looking them up and if it's a musician listening to that kind of music while I'm reading it, and this is going to be a deeply joyous reading experience that I'm finally getting to. I bought this gorgeous hardcover. It's a little faded on the spine, just a little, but the rest of it's in almost brand new condition. I bought it at a Japanese used bookstore that almost never has English language books, but suddenly they had a small shelf full and th the big books were all five bucks. I got this and I got the hardcover of the first two in the Cromwell series by Hilary Mantel for five bucks each and the, the, the all heavy mothers to carry and I had a, it was on my Tuesday, which is my busiest day where I travel all over Tokyo by train. <laughs> my arm was killing me. By the time I got home, finally got started on this one. Just incredible. I have started a translated work of indigenous fiction. It's Manicanetish by Naomi Fontaine and translated from the French by Louise von Floteau. And I'm really enjoying it too. I was a little bit nervous the first day that I read it, which I remember was New Year's Day because the prose is very simple and I wasn't sure that it was going to work. But by the second time I picked it up again, I was really engaged by it. It's about a young Innu woman, and Innu is the name of a nation, an indigenous nation. I talked about this one on the New Year's reading video. The Innu nation, they're an Algonquian-speaking people. The homeland is in the eastern portion of the Quebec Labrador Peninsula. This writer and her protagonist are Innu women, and the protagonist left 
She's a young teacher, but she left several years ago and has come back to teach and is having quite a tough go of it. And it's really quite beautiful. It's very, really, very short. I thought I might have finished it today, but yesterday I was busy doing a bunch of other stuff. So I did almost no reading last yesterday. So I didn't finish it, but I, I will finish it this week and really enjoying it. This is a very strange, engaging little novel from France. To the Slaughterhouse by Jean Giano, an Italian French writer. It's set in World War One. It's set right at the beginning of World War One, and it seems to be not quite realistic. But again, I've read 30 pages. The men of the t of the small little sleepy town have all gone off to war, and there aren't that many shepherds left. And it, then there's this really bizarre, disturbingly detailed scene about what shepherds are left herding it seems like thousands and thousands of sheep through the town and i don't quite understand why there's so many together and neither do the townspeople but everybody feels like it's kind of an omen about the men going off to war and it's just eerie and really quite wonderful this one is translated from the french by norman glass for example the uh, first chapter is entitled war spells ruin for your rams your you rams and your crops it's a very uh, interesting style like i'm not sure is this you know the kind of questions you ask yourself when you're reading and you're not sure is this a realist novel or not like is there something supernatural going on or is it just the superstitions of the townspeople but it's so unclear that it's kind of freaking me out as i read it and i don't mean my allergy to genre no just it's really eerie and I have started the South African novel, The Wanderers, by Impetumi Ntabeni, that was published maybe two or three years ago. And I'm having Bob the Booker and I have a bit of a South African black writers reading project in 2022. And this is the kickoff book. So I've already had Impush or Impetumi on my Bite Size Book Chats. And he is going to come on for a long form chat with Bob and I the end of this month or early February after Bob and I have both read it. And it's a unique writing style. Took me a chapter, uh, you know, 10 or 20 pages to get into, but oh, it's really good. The father was a, uh, last week I was stumbling around calling him a, an ANC soldier. Well, the word would be freedom fighter, right? In the apartheid era, he went into exile and did a lot of, I think, actual fighting. It's not still, still not clear, but let's see what's on the I don't want to say anything that's not on the... Yeah, it's, so it's clear from the synopsis that his daughter, who stayed back in South Africa with her mother, they never heard from him again, or very little. And he never came back in after a part, the end of the apartheid regime. He stayed in Tanzania. And that was weird, and it was very weird for Ruru. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name, that's our protagonist, but she's a young black South African woman. And after her mother dies and uh, she gets to a certain place in life, she decides to go and track him down and she finds out that he's died in Tanzania. And she meets his common law widow, who she didn't know existed, and who gives her, and she's a wonderful lady, I fell in love with her in one page, who gives Ruru the journals that his father wrote. He called them his pillow books uh, as he lay dying. So that's where I'm at in the story. It's early days, but I have such a good feeling about it, which is good because Bob and I are going to be talking to the author, who I've already, you know, starting to get to know a bit. Please join us in the uh, re read it this month before the chat goes up. The chat won't go up until maybe mid-February, but it's so good. So why didn't he come home? What kept him outside of his homeland even after apartheid fell and he's a very literary philosophical man so there's a lot of those kinds of musings in the journal it's really quite delightful and i am not done gushing yet because oh my god rosamund layman's debut novel from 1927 i believe dusty answer is just rocking my world it is one of the most fantastic child-centered third-person narration that I've ever read, and it's because it's refracted through the protagonist's adult consciousness. I think I like it so far even better than The Echoing Grove, a later novel of hers, which I absolutely loved. 
This is just, I've been reading, I read part of it to Lindy, I had Roz, um, I didn't realize Roz had reread it so recently or I wouldn't have troubled her with reading one of my favorite passages to her, but ah, uh, the protagonist is, I don't know where she's at in her adult life because we haven't really touched on that, but she's remembering growing up with no siblings and no friends. Except that next door there was an old lady whose grandchildren would come to visit her for like, I don't know if it was two weeks every summer or three weeks, but that was the only time that this young girl had playmates. And she had precocious, pre-adolescent crushes on some of the boys. And well, what we do know is one of the boys, the boy she had the biggest crush on, is killed in World War I. And so that's about as much as I know about the present adult section of these characters' lives, but the extended reminiscences about childhood, it's absolutely beguiling, intellectually stimulating, really viscerally engaging. Rosamond! Am I the only one that thinks that's cover? I mean, it's a nice photograph, but uh, I think I want to get older editions of these. I haven't checked out what those covers are like, but this is too modern of a photograph for this story, but oh! Uh, you can tell how much I like it. I don't know what to say about it. I absolutely adore what I've read so far. And I have also started the one of the books for Invisible Cities for Singapore, and that is the novel Inheritance by Bally Carr Jaswal. And it started, I've, I've only read it one day, but however many pages I read that day, just totally hooked me. So it's a Punjabi family in Singapore, and the son, who's maybe 20, maybe 18, something scandalous or something uh, humiliating has happened to him or he's done something, I, it's still mysterious. So his father sends him to America to study engineering. He goes just laden with shame and has trouble making connections in his new land. I can't remember where in the States, it's not New York City or anywhere like that, it is. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure, but um, that's all I know so far, but it's uh, really well done. I had done a, read the first chapter of her second novel or her later novel, Erotic Stories for Punjabi Windows, Windows, Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows, and I didn't like the writing. But I think I might just, must have just gotten up on the wrong side of the bed that day, or maybe it's not as good as her debut. That was a 2017 novel. Oh, she's written a bunch of stuff, and this is her 2013 debut. I am really, really enjoying that. The last two I have to tell you about, I have barely got a start on, so I don't have as much of a feel for them or a, in, as much to say. The Japanese novel, the Tokyo Ueno Station by Yu Miri, translated from the Japanese by Morgan Giles. Let's find out. Is it Giles or Giles? I don't worry so much about pronouncing the translator's name correctly, but goodness, this should be easily solved, John. Thank you very much for tuning in. We have recently launched JFNY Literary Series, where we will be inviting notable writers in Japanese literature and their translators, discuss their work, speak on the art of translation, and touch upon the current literary scene in Japan. For our first event, we have invited author Yu Mary and tra translator Morgan Giles. Morgan Giles, okay. Can you remember that, Sean? Giles like jump. And uh, it's about, it's the uh, first person narrative about a elderly homeless man who lives uh, most of the time in parks around Ueno Station in Tokyo looking back on his life. It hasn't yet been revealed in the text, but it's, uh, I know this from the synopsis that he is a... No, I don't think I know. I know the author is Zainichi, Korean Japanese writer, but uh, there's nothing in the synopsis that I can see that the that necessarily the protagonist is. I think I've read the first 20 pages. And I liked it, but I don't have much to say about it yet. I realized that I need an audiobook for January, so I have started on audio, and when I'm at home and in the mood, I will also follow along with the ebook. The gay-themed novel, which is coming out as a movie, or has just come out as a movie, My Policeman by Bethan Roberts. Justina from Ireland and I had a bite-sized chat about it. I'll put a link in the show notes and I was vaguely aware of it, but she totally sold me on it. And I've listened to just, I think, the first chapter on audio while reading along and it, it was good. So it's about a love triangle between two men and the, the policeman's uh, is one of those two men and his wife. 
and it the first chapter is told in her point of view and what we know from the opening of the novel is that she and her policeman husband her bisexual policeman hub husband have stayed together for decades and decades and the lover is dying and comes to live with them for the end at the end of his life i can't remember exactly what eustine has said but there's some connection to em forrester some i think it was maybe based on an autobiographical experience of Forrester's, not that he wrote about, but just that it, it is known, but set much later, I believe, in the 50s. I think the love story, when they were young, is set in the 50s. And yeah, it's very interesting. Oh my goodness! 2022 is starting out fabulous! So nine books is not enough, do you think? So I'm going to start three, and I'm going to be a little coy about one of them, but I'm going to add this novella from Japan in January or January in Japan a novella called Shipwrecks by Akira Yoshimura and that is translated from the Japanese by Mark Ely. I don't even remember how I heard about this but I did and it's set on a coastal village in medieval Japan. Oh well, that sounds pretty interesting. And there is a shipwreck. I will also start the next one for Invisible Cities from Algeria. Now I haven't exactly decided which I'm going to read, but I'm going to read something by Asia Jabbar, I think it would be pronounced, uh, D-J-E-B-A-R. The one that uh, I know the most about is Children of the New World, but I can, I'm going to do some Kindle previews or whatever and uh, do some more research, but I, I'm going to start with Children of the New World. Has anybody out there read Asia Jabbar, one of the most distinguished women writers from the Arab world? So she wrote this after her own involvement in the Algerian resistance to colonial French rule. That's all I need to know. And it's not that long. I will start with that and see how it goes. And then the third one, this is my new policy. If the policy is too formal of a word. But when I try books by friends or anybody who follows me on social media, I'm not going to announce that I'm going to start reading it. I'm not even going to give you a report on how it's going until I'm far enough along to know that I can safely um, say that it's going to be at least a four-star read and otherwise you will never hear about it and it will not be on any social media. But I hope it goes well and I can tell you all about it soon. So that's the third one and that is my Friday Reads. Now I wonder if this video is going to have audio drift. I've got software for that but it takes about an hour to process so I hope you're having a fabulous reading week and uh, I've been doing pretty good with answering comments within 24 to 36 hours often the same day. Tell me what you've been reading. Thanks for watching.